I should say that you sent me a message about not starting early in the morning, <laughs> and that made me feel like we're kindred spirits. <laughs> Yeah. You wrote to me when the great physicist Sidney Coleman was asked to attend a 9 a.m. meeting. His reply was, I can't stay up that late. Yeah. So, Classic. <laughs> Sidney was beloved. I think all the best thoughts, honestly, mm -hmm. maybe the worst thoughts too, are all come at night. There's something, yeah. there's something about the night. Maybe it's the silence. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the peace all around. Maybe it's the darkness. And you just, mm. you could be with yourself and you could think deeply. I feel like they're stolen hours in the middle of the night because it's not busy. Your gadgets aren't pinging. There's really no pressure to do anything, but I'm often awake <laughs> in the middle of the night. And so it's sort of like these extra hours of the day. I think we were exchanging messages at four in the morning. <laughs> okay. So in that way, many other ways, we're kindred spirits. Mm. So let's go. In the, one of the coolest objects in the universe, black holes, what are they? And... Maybe even a good way to start is to talk about how are they formed. Mm, yeah. In a way, people often confuse how they're formed with the concept of the black hole in the first place. So when black holes were first proposed, Einstein was very surprised that such a solution could be found so quickly, but he really thought nature would protect us from their formation. And then nature thinks of a way. Nature thinks of a way to make these crazy objects, which is to kill off a few stars. But then I think that there's a confusion that dead stars, these very, very massive stars that die, are synonymous with the phenomenon of black hole. And it's really not the case. Black holes are more general and more fundamental than just the death state of a star. But even the history of how people realize that stars could form black holes is, is, is quite fascinating because the entire idea really just started as a thought experiment. And if you think of, it's 1915, 1916, when Einstein fully describes relativity in a way that's the canonical formulation. It was a lot of changing back and forth before then. And it's World War I and he gets a message from the Eastern Front, from a friend of his, Carl Schwarzschild, who's who solved Einstein's equations. You know, between sitting in the trenches and like cannon fire, um, it was joked that he was calculating ballistic trajectories. He's also perusing the proceedings of the Prussian Academy of Sciences, <laughs> as you do. <laughs> and he was an astronomer um, who had enlisted in his 40s. And he finds this really remarkable solution to Einstein's equations. And it's the first exact solution. He doesn't call it a black hole. It's not called a black hole for decades. But what I love about what Schwarzschild did is it's a thought experiment. It's not about observations. It's not about making these things in nature. Um, it's really just about the idea. He sets up this completely untenable situation. He says, imagine I crush all the mass of a star to a point. Don't ask how that's done because that's really absurd. Um, but let's just pretend, and let's just imagine that, that that's a scenario. And then he wants to decide what happens to space-time if I set up this confounding but somehow very simple scenario. And really what Einstein's equations were, were telling everybody at the time was that matter and energy curve space and time, and then curved space-time tells matter and energy how to fall once the space time shaped. So he finds this beautiful solution. And the most amazing thing about his solution is he finds this demarcation, which is the event horizon, which is the region beyond which not even light can escape. And if you were to ask me today, all these decades, over 100 years later, I would say that is the black hole. The black hole is not the mass crushed to a point. The black hole is the event horizon. And the event horizon is really just a point in space-time or, or a region in space-time. It's actually, in this case, a surface in space-time. And it marks uh, a separation in events, which is why it's called an event horizon. Everything outside is causally separated from the inside insofar as what's inside the event horizon can't affect events outside. What's outside can affect events inside. I can throw a probe into a black hole and cause something to happen on the inside. But the opposite isn't true. Somebody who fell in can't send a probe out. And this one-way aspect really is what's profound about the black hole. Um, sometimes we talk about the black holes being nothing because at the event horizon, there's really nothing there. Uh, sometimes when we, when we think about black holes, we want to imagine a really dense dead star. But if you go up to the event horizon, it's an empty region 
of space-time. It's, it's more of a place than it is a thing. And Einstein found this fascinating. He helped get the work published, but he really didn't think these would form in nature. I doubt Carl Schwarzschild did either. Um, I think they thought they were uh, solving theoretical, mathematical problems, um, but not describing this what turned out to be the end state of gravitational collapse. And maybe the purpose of the thought experiment was to find the limitations of the theory. So you, you find the most mm -hmm. extreme versions in order to understand where it breaks down. Yeah. And it just so happens in this case that might actually predict these extreme kinds of objects. It does both. So it also describes the sun from far away. So the same solution does a great job helping us understand the Earth's orbit around the sun. It's incredible. It does a great job. It's almost overkill. <laughs> you don't really need to be that precise as relativity. Um, and yes, it predicts the phenomenon of black holes, but doesn't really explain how nature would form them. But then it also, on top of that, does signal the breakdown of the theory. I mean, you're quite right about that. It actually says, oh man, but you, you go all the way towards the center, and yeah, this doesn't sound right anymore. Um, sometimes I liken it to, you know, it's like a dying man marking in the dirt <laughs> that something's gone wrong here, right? It, it, it's signaling that, that there's some culprit, there's something wrong in the theory. And, um, and even Roger Penrose, who did this general work trying to understand uh, the formation of black holes from gravitational collapse, he thought, oh yeah, there's a singularity that's inevitable. It's in every, there's no way around it once you form a black hole. But he said, this is probably just a shortcoming of the fact that we've forgotten to include quantum mechanics and that when we do, we'll understand this um, differently. So according to him, the closer you get to the singularity, the more quantum mechanics comes into play and therefore there's no singularity, there's something else. I think everybody would say that. I think everybody would say, the closer you get to the singularity, for sure you have to include quantum mechanics. You just can't consistently talk about magnifying such small scales, having such enormous uh, ruptures and and curvatures and energy scales and not include quantum mechanics, that that's just inconsistent with the world as we understand it. So you've described the brain-breaking idea that a black hole is uh, not so much a super dense matter as it's sometimes described, mm -hmm. but it's more akin to you know a region of space time, but even more so, just nothing. Yeah, it's nothing. That, that's the thing you seem to like to say. Can I do. You... I do like to say that <laughs> black holes are no thing. No They're thing. Nothing. Okay. So what? Um, what, is, what does that and mean? That's cause... that's what I mean. That's the more profound aspect of the black hole. So you asked originally, um, how do they form? And I think that 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 even when you try to form them in messy astrophysical systems, there's still nothing at the end of the day left behind. And um, this was a very big surprise, even though Einstein accepted that this was a true prediction. He didn't think that that they'd be made. And, and it was quite astounding that, that people like Oppenheimer, actually it's probably Oppenheimer's most important theoretical work, um, who were thinking about nuclear physics and quantum mechanics, but in the context of these kind of utopian questions. Why do stars shine? Um, why is the sun radiant and hot and this amazing source of light? And it was people like Oppenheimer who began to ask the question, well, could stars collapse to form black holes? Could they become so dense that uh, eventually not even light would escape. And that's why I think people think that black holes are these dense objects. That's often how it's described. But actually what happens, these very massive stars, they're burning thermonuclear fuel. You know, they're earthfuls of thermonuclear fuel they're burning um, and emitting energy in E equals MC squared energy. So it's fusing, it's a fusion bomb. It's a constantly going thermonuclear bomb. And um, eventually it's going to run out of fuel. It's going to run out of hydrogen, helium stuff to fuse. It hits an iron core. Iron, to go past iron with fusion, is actually energetically expensive. So it's no longer going to do that so easily. So suddenly it's run out of fuel. And if the star is very, very, very massive, much more massive than our sun, maybe 20, 30 times the mass of our sun, it'll collapse under its own weight. And that collapse is incredibly fast 
and dramatic, and it creates a shockwave. So that's the supernova explosion. So a lot of these, they rebound because once they crunch, they've reached a new critical uh, capacity where they can reignite to higher elements, heavier elements, and that sets off a bomb, essentially. So the star explodes, helpfully, because that's why you and I are here, because stars send their material back out into space, and you and I get to be made of carbon and oxygen and all this good stuff. We're not just hydrogen. So the suns do that for us. And then what's left sometimes ends at a neutron star, which is a very cool object, very fascinating object, super dense, uh, but bigger than a black hole, meaning it's, it's, it's not compact enough to become a black hole. It's an actual thing. A neutron star is a real thing. It's like a giant neutron. Literally, electrons get jammed into the protons and make this giant nucleus and this superconducting matter. Very strange amazing objects. But if it's heavier than that, the core, and that's you know heavier than twice the mass of the sun, um, it will become a black hole. And Oppenheimer was wrote this beautiful paper in 1939 with his student uh, saying that they believed that the end state of gravitational collapse is actually a black hole. This is stunning and really... Um, a visionary conclusion. Now, the paper is published the same day the Nazis advance on Poland. <laughs> and so it does not get a lot of fanfare in the newspapers. <laughs> yeah, we, we think there's a lot of drama today on social media. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah. Like, here's a guy who predicts how actually in nature would be the formation of this most radical of object that broke even Einstein's brain, mm -hmm. while one of the most evil, if not the most evil humans in history, starting a, uh, the mm -hmm. first steps of a global war. What I also love about that lesson is how agnostic science is. Yeah. Because he was asking these utopian questions, as were other people of the time, about the nuclear physics and stars. You might know this play, Copenhagen, by Michael Frayn. There's this line that he attributes to Bohr. And Bohr was the great thinker of early foundations of quantum mechanics, Danish physicist, where Bohr says to his wife, nobody's thought of a way to kill people using quantum mechanics. Now, of course, then there's the nuclear bomb. And what I love about this was the pressure scientists were under to do something with this nuclear physics and, and to enter this race over um, a nuclear weapon. But really, at the same time, 1939, really uh, Oppenheimer's thinking about black holes. There's a there's even a small line in Chris Nolan's film. It's very hard to catch. There's a reference to it in the film where he they're sort of joking. Well, I guess nobody's going to pay attention to your paper now, you know, because uh, because of the Nazi advance on Poland. That's the other remarkable thing about Oppenheimer is he's also a central figure in the construction of the bomb. Right. So it's theory and experiment clashing together right. with the geopolitics. Exactly. So, of course, Oppenheimer, now known as the father of the atomic bomb, um, he talks about destroyers of worlds. Um, but it's the same technology. And that's what I mean by science is agnostic, right? It's the same technology, overcoming a critical mass, um, igniting thermonuclear fusion, Eventually, there was a fission. The original bomb was a fission bomb, and fission was first shown by Lise Meitner, who showed that a certain uranium, when you bombarded it with protons, broke into smaller pieces that were less than the uranium, right? So some of that mass, that E equals MC squared energy, had escaped, and it was the first kind of concrete demonstration of this Einstein's most famous equation. So all of this comes together. But the story of, um, they still weren't called black holes. This is 1939. <laughs> and they had these very long-winded ways of describing the end state, the catastrophic end state of gravitational collapse. But what you have to imagine is as this star collapses, so now, so what's the sun? The sun's a million and a half kilometers across. So imagine a star much bigger than the sun, much bigger radius, and it's so heavy, it collapses, it's supernovas, what's left is still maybe 10 times the mass of the sun, just what's left in that core. And it continues to collapse. And when that reaches about 60 kilometers across, like just imagine 10 times the mass of the sun, city-sized, that is a really dense object. And now the black hole essentially has begun to form, meaning the curve in space-time is so tremendous that not even light can escape. 
the event horizon forms, but the event horizon is almost imprinted on the space-time because the star can't sit there in that dense state any more than it can race outward at the speed of light because even light is forced to rain inwards. So the star continues to fall. And that's the magic part. The star leaves the event horizon behind and it continues to fall and it falls into the interior of the black hole where it goes, nobody really knows, but it's gone from sight. It goes dark. There's this quote by John Wheeler, who's like granddaddy of American relativity, and he has a line that's something to the effect, um, the star, like the Cheshire cat, fades from view. One leaves behind only its grin, the other only its gravitational attraction. And he was giving a lecture. It's actually above Tom's Restaurant, you know, from Seinfeld near Columbia in New York. <laughs> nice. <laughs> there was a, a, a place there. There still is a place there where people were giving lectures about astrophysics. And it's 1967. Wheeler is exhaustively saying this loaded term, the end state of catastrophic gravitational collapse. And rumor is that someone shouts from the back row, well, how about black hole? And um, apparently he then foists this term on the world. <laughs> Wheeler had a way of doing that. Well, I love terms like that. Big bang, black hole. Mm -hmm. There's some, I mean, it's just pointing out the elephant in the room and calling it an elephant. It is a black hole. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty... Uh, Accurate and deep description. I just wanted to point out that the, just looking for the first time, it's a 1939 paper from Oppenheimer. Mm. It's like two pages, it's like three pages. Oh yeah, it's gorgeous. <laughs> it's, the simplicity yeah. of some of these, that's yeah. so gangster, just revolutionize yeah. all of physics with, this, with you know, and Einstein did that multiple times in a simple right. year. Mm -hmm. When all thermonuclear sources of energy are exhausted, a sufficiently heavy star will collapse. That's mm -hmm. an opener. Mm -hmm. Unless fission, Due to rotation, the radiation of mass or the blowing off of mass by radiation reduce the star's mass to orders right. of that of the sun. This contraction will continue indefinitely. Mm -hmm. And it goes on that way. Yeah. Now, I have to say that Wheeler, who actually coins the term black hole, uh, gives Oppenheimer quite a terrible time about this. He thinks he's wrong. And they entered what has sometimes been described as kind of a bitter, I don't know if you would actually say feud, but there were bad feelings. And um, Wheeler actually spent decades uh, saying Oppenheimer was wrong. And eventually, with his computer work, that early work that Wheeler was doing with computers when he was also trying to understand nuclear weapons, and in peacetime world found themselves returning again to these astrophysical questions, uh, decided that actually Oppenheimer had been right. He thought it was too simplistic, too idealized a setup that they had used and that if you you looked at something that was more realistic and more complicated that it it just simply it just would go away and in fact he he draws the opposite conclusion and there's a story that Oppenheimer was sitting outside of the auditorium when Wheeler was coming forth with his declaration that in fact black holes were the likely end state of gravitational collapse for very very heavy stars and um, when asked about it, Oppenheimer sort of said, well, I've moved on to other things. 